Hello uh, and welcome to a uh, fireside chat uh, about community needs uh, in the context of uh, connectivity and, and 5G, uh, which is a, a key part of the 5G new thinking toolkit. Uh, this video is to talk to some of those who uh, have uh, a, a, a lot of knowledge uh, and experience to bring uh, to, uh, to, to, that, uh, to that element. Um, for me personally, um, uh, it's one of my uh, most important parts of, uh, of the work that, uh, that gets done, uh, understanding what the community um, is asking for and, and, and really needs, uh, makes a huge difference to the level of engagement and adoption and everything else uh, that, uh, that the rest of the projects um, and, uh, depend on. Uh, my name is Peter Sherman, uh, I'm going to chair this, uh, this, uh, this conversation uh, and I'm going to introduce our, uh, our, our three esteemed panellists. Uh, Catherine, if I can come to you first. So I'm Catherine Weldon. I'm here on behalf of the Borderlands Partnership, which is made up of uh, Cumbria, Northumberland, Dumfries and Galloway and Scottish Borders. And we are working to um, affect tr uh, transformational economic improvement in the, the Borderlands region. Um, so we're a we are a very large area. We, we represent about 10% of the UK landmass, but we only have about um, 1.1 million residents. But at the same time, we receive well over 40 million visitors per year. We provide water, power, food, building materials to the rest of the UK. And uh, we, we sort of also have some uh, major innovation uh, companies and, and things going on, as well as some uh, very traditional and very uh, remote communities. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, Shona. Hi, Peter. Uh, good to see you. Um, I'm from uh, the Orkney Islands, uh, which is, um, I work for the local authority, Orkney Islands Council, um, and uh, I've been uh, part of the this consortia that's looking to improve connectivity um, using 5G uh, to trial um, to trial technology uh, to look at ways to improve connectivity um, in an area that is uh, is recognised as being the worst in terms of connectivity. Uh, that's both in terms of mobile coverage um, as well as uh, broadband access to services. Um, that's uh, been highlighted uh, during this pandemic um, is just how important connectivity is uh, to our everyday lives. Um, for me, it's now just one of the essential services, just as water and power is. Um, so from my point of view, this is a very, very high priority problem uh, to, to the Orkney Islands um, and its residents. Thank you, Shona. Uh, and last but no means least, uh, Kate. Hi, so I'm Kate Clifford. I'm the Director of Rural Community Network Northern Ireland. Um, we are a membership-based, owned and managed organisation which advocates on behalf of rural communities right across the north of Ireland. A big part of our job is around addressing issues of poverty and disadvantage. And the biggest issue that we faced in terms of poverty and disadvantage is around access to services, key services, and one of which, as Shona has already said, we believe is the connectivity of rural communities into both mobile and digital technology. Um, I suppose as, as an organization, we've been in existence for 30 years. And as an organization, we have spent an awful lot of time advocating for connectivity in communities who want it. And I suppose that's a really key point in terms of this morning's um, debate and discussion in that some of the communities that we're working with have actively campaigned against mobile phone technology and against 5G technology. And so when we got involved in this project, it was very much about working with the wishes of those that we've described it as a coalition of the willing. Um, it was very much about who needs this technology, who wants it. And then as, as Shona has already alluded to, as, as COVID hit, it became more and more um, obvious to us that, that the digital divide in rural was not only about access to know-how and access to adequate devices, but it was also about reliable and affordable digital connectivity. And that for us has been the campaign trail that we've been on 
particularly over the last two years, but really over the last 10 to 15 years, where we have really looked to see how we could unlock the potential of that in very many rural areas across rural Northern Ireland. And we're a jurisdiction of only about the size of Yorkshire. Um, but 36% of the population live outside of towns that are 5,000 and above. So we have a huge rural population. We're not hugely remote in the same way that the Borderlands area would be or the Orkneys would be, but we still have communities who live outside of areas that are well serviced. Um, and access to services, I say, is one of the biggest disadvantages many of our rural groups um, have. Thank you, Kate. And that's really interesting. That's a perfect segue because one of the um, one of the things I think is most important to understand uh, is often that the, commun the communities we're talking about here, then it's not it's not homogenous. You know, there there are different there's different groups. You've, you know, there's demographic trends and so on and so forth. Um, uh, maybe Sharon, if I come to you, how do you think about uh, the way that your your group in all you know, the Orkney community uh, kind of break down, if you like, and, and what, uh, uh, what do you suggest about what, different ways to engage those, uh, you know, some who might be early adopters, some who actively campaign against and, and all things in between? Yeah, I, I mean, uh, for, those, uh, for those that don't know Orkney, um, the, the first thing I would say is come and visit it because it is absolutely beautiful. Um, and we do have a lot of people come, come to, to visit our islands. Um, but but that that in itself is is part of the problem if if you like in terms of delivering services. So there are a number of inhabited islands um, with with relatively low levels of population. Um, you know in the the mid hundreds, um, and they rely on a ferry network. And in fact, their bus service is a is a, is a small aircraft. Um, so you know for many people. Uh, and particularly um, for those groups that maybe are looking at policy and delivery of, of services, then um, there, there maybe isn't a strong understanding of, um, of what it's like, uh, not just to live in a rural area, but what it's like to live on an island where you, you can't just uh, jump in the car and go and travel somewhere if your mobile phone doesn't work. I mean, we're, we're talking about communities where there is no services. Um, so, you know, we, we Within Orkney, the main town of, of Kirkwall, uh, for instance, where half the population of Orkney reside, um, you know, generally have reasonable connectivity, but those living out with the area have poor connectivity. Um, and as I say, in our, some of our outer islands, it's extremely poor. Um, and for me, this is about an equality of access. Uh, so they deserve it the same as uh, people living in high population densities deserve it as much as anyone else. Um, and there shouldn't really be a, a divide in terms of um, not, not just access to services, but to the opportunity that uh, technology affords individuals. So um, I, I guess my concern is about making sure networks are available rather than how they are used as such, um, because how people go on and use the, the, um, these services is, is opportunity for all, um, as well as, as I say, in terms of delivery of services. Now we, we do have um, uh, through through previous five uh, G programs, um, as I say, working with you um, in the past, Peter, is, is there was a very small pocket um, of uh, what, what I would call suspicion um, in terms of five G, and that that did lead to uh, us having to be very careful in how we communicated what we were trying to do and what we were trying to achieve. But you're never ever going to please everybody, regardless. I mean. Um, I don't think any of us uh, are, are immune to uh, false and fake news that go around, but I mean, all we can do is put across the message um, and the information uh, that, that, that we have um, and you know, try to, to, to deal with, uh, with any of the problems that come up. And, and I think we did that, we did that well, uh, but I, I won't say everybody was absolutely convinced by it. Um, I think the, the, the common issue I have and the common issue I get is well why don't you just put fibre to my premises because that's the long term and foolproof solution um, but the, the, the reality and, and what we've found with our projects is it, it, it isn't cost effective to do that to very very small levels of population and in particular in Orkney we've got subsea cable uh, which is even more expensive to deliver so um, you know I, I, th I think the challenge of uh, providing 
an adequate service at reasonable cost is what this is ultimately about. Um, and this is about looking at technical solutions to, to deliver that. Thank you. Um, and just going on with Catherine, you, with the area that Borderlands covers uh, is, is actually you know, incredibly diverse uh, in, in many ways. Um, uh, you, and you, you've got employer groups and so on in, in, in those regions as well. Uh, what, does, uh, what does community engagement look like for you in, uh, in, in, in that area? When we're dealing with uh, communities that have very, very poor services, similar to, to sort of what Shona has been describing, um, the, the important thing is to find a community champion, somebody that's actually going to, to sort of push and push the project forward. Things can't happen without at least one or two people in a community that really, really want to engage, want to, to move something forward. But then generally we find that people just want their services to work. They, they want their services to work in Buttermere or in um, the sort of outskirts of, of Drum Priest in exactly the same way as they'd want their services to work in the centre of Manchester. And they want their 4G services and they want their sort of fixed line services. And we've got such a mixed bag of communities at the moment. We've got um, some of the 0.3% most challenging to connect uh, properties in the UK are, are sitting in the borderlands. Um, but at the same time, we've got um, some sort of uh, small towns and, and large villages which um, have reasonable sort of basic connectivity but could sort of require 5G and, and other similar high, um, high specification connectivity in order to sort of safeguard visitors or um, benefit from agri-tech. We are obviously a massive, massive farming area. Um, and like, like Shona, we, we sort of do get people saying, we'll just put full fiber in. But it might not be just about the fibre. We might need fibre and 4G and 5G and 6 or 7G as and when they develop, depending on what the options are. Because we are subject to um, extreme weather events, uh, we did very, very badly in Storm Arwen um, this, this year and other sort of, of the named storms. Fibre isn't always going to be enough. We, we need um, a mix of connectivity. And mostly, as I say, we, we deal with these uh, highly motivated, highly interested individuals who will bring along a lot of the community for the ride, uh, who just want good services. We have had... Um, concerns raised from a very small number of very frightened people who are, are suspicious of new technology, be it 5G or LED-based street lighting. And I think the only thing we can do is keep putting high quality information out there to try and help people understand what we're doing, what the safety records are, uh, so that they can, they can sort of understand better why we believe that the route forward is safe. Um, it, it's really all about education, 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 alongside working with, with locals who are really interested and, and have a way forward for these services. Because it, it could be that all that people really want is for their Wi-Fi and their emails to work, in which case that's that's the needs that we'll be pushing to, to deliver. But if you've actually got opportunities there for drones, for, um, uh, for sort of lots of data modeling in case of flood risk, all of that stuff we, we want to, to be looking for and supporting through Borderlands because we want 
to see long-term improvements for our communities. Thank you. And I think, uh, just pick up a thread there on, certainly on the local champions uh, side of it. Um, Kate, who, um, when you're thinking about how you, you, you pull together the, that coalition and building, who are the key stakeholders uh, in, uh, for, for a community to think about? I think we, we started with an idea that um, we took an asset-based approach. So, so we have, right across rural Northern Ireland, a series of community groups and those community groups have tended to be the people who have wanted to see change um, happen in their communities. They're the people who have been at the forefront of local development. So there's been sort of two approaches on our, on our part. One, which was around that who's interested in this and who sees this as a nut worth cracking um, for their communities into the future. And the second bit was around and then how do we make it happen and what do they need to be informed with? So what do they need to be armed with by way of information? in order to help them to make the best possible decisions for their community. So the way in which we would always approach it is starting with, well, what do we hold in our hand? What information do we have? What policies, what government objectives, what program for government do we have in our hand? So when we go out to communities to address just exactly what Catherine's talking about, like the fear that's out there, um, part of that is around, well, let's not dismiss that fear. Let's not override it. Let's talk through what that fear is. And is that false information? Is it good information? Is it sound? Is it scientifically based? Um, and it's not about persuading people to change their mind. That's not our job. Our job is around giving the right facts to, at the right time to people who inquire and also being aware that you know, there's stuff with, outside of our gift to deliver, outside of our gift to give assurances on. So we work largely with um, border rural communities who, who where during the troubles and the conflict in Northern Ireland watched um, through, you know, different watchtowers and borders being, you know, the, you know, the, ma the border was manned. We had a hard border on the island of Ireland. And so there are communities there that are very suspicious of any infrastructure going up and particularly if that infrastructure has been put in by others. Um, and that's a legacy of the troubles in this region. We couldn't, and on any regard, we could not dismiss that fear in that community. So a big part of our job is not being about saying, you know, you will come with us and you will be on this journey and we will invest and this will happen. It's being about how do we make this happen in a way that you continue to feel safe and the security that you've built in your community over time, particularly since the peace process. How do we help you to negotiate and navigate your way in a way that's trusted um, for you and for the community that you serve? And that's been a big issue for us in, in terms of any infrastructure that has gone on in Northern Ireland, particularly anything that, you know, is by by virtue of its, the fact that it could be managed or controlled by government. And we can't dismiss that. It, you know, it's a reality of living here in a contested, um, set, well, contested area and particularly along borders. So, I mean, that hasn't gone away and it's something that we have to be very aware of and very mindful of. In terms of a lot of the groundwork, um, I mean, as with any community development activity, it is about identifying as Catherine said, who are the champions in the communities that you can work with? Who are the forward thinkers? Who are the people who are willing to give it a go and to take risks? Um, and I think the big part on, on a lot of this is the round, it is risk-taking stuff. We embarked on this project, you know, um, at a time when five, well, a time when digital technology was elusive in Northern Ireland. Um, and while we were on this project, while we were part of this project, um, it was announced that Project Stratum had been awarded and we had full fibre to premises for most rural properties in Northern Ireland with an end date of 2024. Then COVID hit and the need to get online and the, as we described it, the Northern Ireland digital revolution happened because people really needed to get online and get online quickly and have reliable, affordable broadband. So I think that over the time of this project, there's been an awful lot of change in many of the communities. Communities who weren't well in, in the first instance to become digitally included are now scrambling to be digitally included. There's been a lot of work about what the internet and what 5G and what particularly the internet of things can unlock for many rural areas. And there's been a re-looking, I suppose, as well about community wealth building. And that has become something that's become center, front and center in Northern Ireland. And that wealth building is about looking to see, just as I said earlier on, what do we hold in our hands? What have we got here? And how can we build on that? And I think the other thing that has happened is 
the ambition to look at other places. So when we've been out in Northern Ireland talking to our community groups and saying, you know, your connectivity, it's bad, but it's not as bad as it was in Orkney. And they're saying, has Orkney got this? And that has been a really good lesson for us in that when we talk about mainland England, lots and lots of our groups kind of tend to think of it being very well connected. They don't think about the rural, they think about the large cities like Manchester, London, Liverpool. They don't tend to equate it with rural England, which is badly connected, as badly, if not worse, than, than Northern Ireland. But when you talk about a place like the, the Orkneys that has embarked on this project, suddenly people's eyes light up and they, they, they understand that that's remote. They understand it's extremely remote. And they also understand the, the reality that it is, you know, it's distant from a mainland. And therefore, it, and that then sometimes, sometimes that helps to sell the idea that, you know, they're already looking at this as a community. It's a wealth building asset. It's a way of connecting their community and making sure that they're fit for fit for purpose right into the 21st century. And that's hugely important. That's a hugely important part of this project has been a partnership development that has allowed us to look elsewhere and to give those examples as ways to crack this nut um, in other areas or, and, and to show showcase to communities what the art of the possible. And a very long answer. That is an excellent answer. Thank you. Because the, this, this idea of community wealth building uh, is, it's really interesting. You know, I'm, 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 I grew up in the in the era of kind of social capital uh, development and, and concepts like that. Uh, and you know, I've seen programs like you know, skills banks and wisdom banks and things like that uh, in areas to see like how is it that we can look at what we have here, uh, the skill base that we have, you know, retired groups, and veterans here, and, and things like that, where, where actually there's a lot that we can offer ourselves if we truly um, organise. Peter, I think there's been a. a part of the, the difficulty in many of our groups is that they don't understand what they do hold. So they have, you know, they have huge commitment in their local communities. There's, there's a bank of volunteers, people out there who have huge levels of skills and resources to their fingertips, but they're never asked to be part of anything or they don't, they don't scan the environment to see that Johnny, who's the builder, could erect a, a you know, a, could give, I don't know, to, give over infrastructure or could be part of the design of something different for their communities. But the other thing that they don't see is they own buildings and that those buildings could be a relay point from which 5G could be relayed out to their community at an affordable and accessible rate. I think that, you know, that there's a lot that our communities kind of take for granted. We built Millennium Halls, built 22 Millennium Halls right across rural Northern Ireland um, in the year 2000. And when you look at those 22 Millennium Halls, every one of them is you know still going strong, still being utilised every day of the week. Um, but for many areas, they're kind of waiting on the council to put in the free Wi-Fi in the local town. They don't see how their centre could be used as you know a centre that provides better Wi-Fi or, or better connectivity. And that for me is the kind of the switching on the light bulbs to realise you know let's how do we use our assets differently? How do we project out from a church steeple? How do we protect you know from all of these community owned resources? How do we make use of those better in order to improve connectivity? And, and we just haven't explored that well enough with many of our groups. Uh, I'd like to pick up on um, showing the view if I may on the point that the Kay there about about risk taking, um, and in particular um, the role of the local authority. Because uh, I'm interested in that, because if we're if we're talking about local champions and others, and, and asking them to essentially, you know, you've got we need ad, local advocates, we need people who want to raise a flag and, and call call people to it. Um, what do you think the role is in uh, uh, in this for, for for the local authority? And you know, uh, first of all, just um, to 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 kind of endorse uh, what, what Kate and Catherine have both been saying, because um, I I almost take for granted. Uh, the amount of voluntary activity that takes place in rural communities, um, because in general, rural communities wouldn't survive without that volunteer attitude. Um, and it, it's only when you go elsewhere, as I say, to the cities, and that there is this sense of it's it's provided for you rather than you have to go and actually, um, you know, take the initiative. Uh, but in taking that initiative, you need to be supported. So I think that's... Uh, a nice, uh, a nice way of answering your question. In other words, is um, it's it's all very well for people to say, "I want better broadband." Um, my community is poorly served. It, it's the how do I go about getting it? So there is a 
there is a willingness within my community who have identified the problem. Now, how, how can we go about making things better for our community? So, and I think that's where things like um, a supportive network that you can access uh, comes in. And it's things like, as a local authority, we have recognised that broadband connectivity is particularly poor in our area. Um, and the, the council has, uh, has prioritised improving that. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean doing it itself on behalf of the community, but it does mean taking a proactive approach to, to helping those communities uh, find a solution or to unlocking some of the problems um, that are preventing a, um, um, a, a community in, in seeking their own solutions. Um, and I think if, if, if there's things that I've um, learned, I mean, I've learned so much uh, um, as part of this project is, is that we are all, um, we don't need to know how electricity works, but we need access to it. And, and I think when it comes to things like broadband, people immediately don't understand it and are, are therefore scared by it. So where do I start? How do I get connectivity in my area? And I wouldn't know where to start. So I think projects like this have been excellent at, um, at, at trying to identify um, what is it people want. Let's not get too muddled with the technical aspects um, of, uh, of how, how um, radio waves work and what frequencies I need and how do I get licenses and you know all of the stuff that actually make things sound an awful lot harder than they actually are. Um, so if, if, there's, if there's one thing that I think um, you know the public sector and, and bodies such as uh, as Kate and Catherine uh, represent is is that we can be the kind of conduit facilitator as as, as well as the going out and investing. Um, so one of the things we 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 we're looking at as part of this project is um, not not just uh, the, the needs of the individual, but also the big public sector bodies. Um, they have to deliver services to individuals, and if those individuals have poor connectivity, then we are uh, failing in our duty to deliver our services to them. So so we have a double vested interest, I believe, in in trying to do something to to. Um, improve connectivity in our areas um, and you know you know my, my view is local authorities have a very very powerful role uh, not just because of uh, a number of services they provide you know such as the planning aspects of, of building networks but in terms of their community and economic development then they have an extremely strong role to to, to play um, and that that sometimes means taking risks um, you know, I think a lot of people are very, very surprised that that the Orkney has managed to um, have a test network built in our area. Um, you know, we we've managed to get the mighty companies such as Cisco, the you know the top universities, actually coming to our area. Um, and I think we feel very, very small um, in in our place in the universe. But actually, uh, small communities can make big differences. Um, if those lessons are taken out with our areas, and, and I, I similarly have very much enjoyed and um, learned a lot from working with with Kate and Catherine because we all have the same issues, but we have maybe slightly different technical solutions to to actually achieving improving improved connectivity. So so there isn't a one size uh, fits. You know, he, here's here's the template. Follow this template, and this is what you need. Um, but it, it is trying to prove um, the pathway and the process that allows an active and um, interested community to actually to come up with their own solution and be able to operate, you know, operate networks in their area successfully. And the last little point I would make is local ownership has has a massive, massive bonus to a community. Um, so if you own and operate something. Uh, then you're much more likely to get support within your community um, and also get a willingness within your community to to participate and and support. So I think all of these things are, are, are like massive, massive ticks and plus points to, to successful delivery in, in, in rural settings. I, I've, I've got captured uh, as kind of government as convener, uh, government as economic developer, 
and that government as consumer uh there's almost like sort of three roles that you, you could pick out as a local authority playing in in, in that um uh, let me come to you catherine is that um how does that resonate with the borderlands uh and the, and the way that you work i, I would definitely agree i would definitely agree i mean we each of the Borderlands partner councils, we're all being pushed to do more with less. And one of the big savings for um, services is providing things online first. And in fact, the, the, the biggest possible saving is, is to go online only, but we know that connectivity and skills is not there. Um, sufficiently for everyone to take advantage of, of accessing services online. And some of our uh, communities that are very vulnerable, particularly people who are working on the land, who may be at massive risk for mental health issues, lone working issues, all sorts of, of crime and, and sort of um, other issues in extreme weather events, um, that safeguarding role means that we really want to uh, create opportunities for improving digital connectivity. But at the same time, we've got some, um, some very independent communities that want to do things their own way. And so they're very good at it as well. They, they are very good at knowing what their, their sort of soil is like, knowing what their, their exact geography like is like, Who's going to? Who's got which skills in there? Um, and so, a lot of the time, what we've done as in, in local authority roles is is maybe just create a simple pathway so that the very active individual and sometimes they're they're very highly skilled individuals. We've got ex network engineers or, or other specialists in, in various uh, small communities typically retirees, um, and they might start talking about something in very technical terms and frighten off the rest of their community. Whereas when we come in and look at things in, in very simplistic terms, then we can sometimes be just that little bit of backbone, that bit of support, and um, in some ways a little bit of legitimacy in that we might understand the technical jargon and be able to translate that in a way that, that helps the rest of the community. We'll be able to say to the community, right, this is an option. And we've checked how it sort of fits with um, what you're allowed to do on the roads, what you're allowed to do planning wise. Um, with there to uh, point, we've got a lot of Roman remains and other um, uh, historic monuments dotted around the borderlands. And so very often, if we're sort of sitting there as alongside the, the project, we can point people in the right direction for archeologists, or we might be already linked into the national parks. Um, and so we're very much, we, we sort of, we are a consumer, we're a facilitator, and in some ways we're just sitting there as a, as a source of information and translation. Um, the team that I, I sort of work in quite a lot of the time, um, we're made up of three and a half individuals, um, and we, we focus primarily in Cumbria, but then support into the, the wider borderlands. And very often you've got, uh, you, you'll have a community group that's made up of one very technical, very driven individual, but the rest just need that little bit of support, that little bit of handholding to, to show them that they've not gone so far down the rabbit hole that nobody understands what's going on. <laughs> and so that, that's, that's very much where I see our role is, is being there at the end of the phone and saying, look, we're dealing with a very challenging area um, and Borderlands, we will be different from uh, Kate and Shona in that in Northern Ireland and in the Orkney Islands, it's already recognised 
uh, by UK government that um, the big national programs, Project Gigabit and the, the previous national superfast programs and the shared rural network program that are both work, all working at the moment, um, the Highlands and Islands and, and Northern Ireland, they got their own individual approaches agreed but in borderlands we're expecting to sort of follow a little bit of the national programs but we know because we've got such challenging areas that there's also going to need to be these bespoke solutions but communities are so good at designing and, and so we we have to sort of balance between what we can see going on from a national point of view against how can we create opportunities for these communities to, to, to use their skills to, to do what's really going to fit for them and, and fit for the future? Um, and also, once the connectivity is there, is how can we give those communities opportunities to build skills and, and use that connectivity? So it might be just putting in their, their local newsletters this is where there's going to be some basic skills courses going, or this is where there's going to be some business support going. Or it might be uh, that we provide um, sort of a, a blueprint for a, a bring your own device coffee morning. So quite a lot of the time, um, if, you, if you get people to bring the new iPad that the grandkids have given them to uh, a coffee morning, there'll be somebody there that, they might already know and have a cup of tea with but um that knows how to do what they want to, that ipad to do so it and sometimes that's easier and more comfortable for communities that have been traditionally excluded from um digital skills training because they're talking to what they consider to be a, a real person who, who really understands where they're coming from so i think that's that's it with local authorities we need to be consumers, facilitators, and we need to continue that hand-holding, that education and, and sort of opportunity creation so that once digital technology can be moved in, that it, people can use it and, and sort of get opportunities to, uh, to benefit from, uh, from this sort of investment. I think that's an ex excellent explanation as well of uh, why, as a project, we started the uh, we, we we looked at the toolkit concept uh, because the learning that we've got in each of your each of your three individual experiences uh, is uh, is so rich and so to be so helpful uh, to, to to others who are starting out on that journey. Uh, but I think it's really important that that gets that gets captured, and, and we have a way to to, to to build on that, and and, uh, and people can learn from the from, from the excellent things that have, uh, that have come before. Um, if I may, I'll just come to each of you just for any, for any final thoughts, uh, uh, any, any anything that's uh, that we haven't covered that you wanted to say, or, or anything Peter, can, that's sorry. important. Yeah, hey, so it just I, I really wanted to come in on that last point because I think I think some of the things that are missing is uh, a policy driver for this. So I, I think that while we have, um, what we've had in Northern Ireland has been um, councils, very, very often our councils have actually been the only people who have gathered the data on the missing connectivity and, and captured the real data. So a really big driver for connectivity in Northern Ireland has been councils like Fermanagh, Oma and Mid Ulster Council here went out and specifically asked people what their digital sec um, connectivity was like at home and in their premises. That then provided a mapping exercise in Northern Ireland. So, so if I just give you a very quick example and other networks are available, we'll say that before we start. So BT tells me that I have connectivity at my house using mobile phone technology. They were doing a fantastic deal which was a five pound SIM card if you were a BT customer. We have four mobile phones in this house. That was 20 quid a month for the four mobile phones for unlimited data. Sounded like a great deal. But I ended up with two children stranded up on the Glen Sheen Pass, which is about two and a half to three miles from here, 
with no lighting, no street lights and, and no footpath to get to my home because their mobile phone signal didn't carry them down to the house here. I literally had to do four cartwheels and put a sticky bit of plastic in your head before you get any sort of a signal. It was crazy. But that's the issue for me has been that, you know, we're being told by large companies very often that we have good connectivity or that there is coverage in particular areas, but we know that there are not spots, black spots, places where connectivity doesn't reach. But until the local authority goes out and does a dedicated data survey and gathers that information along with the cooperation of communities, we will never get a real picture as to what digital connectivity actually looks like for people. So I think there, there's been a really important role in terms of that enabling, enabling and mobilizing data gathering, good data collection, which is live data collection. I think there's also has to be a central policy around because the universal um, minimum speed, um, what was it called, universal basic service agreement was something then that gave the impetus to many companies that kind of well sat back and were quite happy to say, oh, we've got coverage, but they didn't actually at any point, they weren't really called to account. The universal service obligation a central policy was an absolute huge game changer in terms of rural areas. But I think that policy making then around wealth building, around supporting communities and enabling communities to unlock the potential of rural areas and provide additional services. I, I, I think to round your argument around government not only being a convener, but also a consumer and also someone who provides services, I think that's a really important argument. But I think for me, the, the, the asks that I would have government is around that data-driven evidence base. They have the resource to do that much more than rural communities have. And very often we have been the ones shouting and you know, saying things are not as good as they are. And then they would take at face value the, the words of um, large companies or large organizations who were saying, yeah, we do have good coverage here. And we were saying, well, we don't because we're living it and we know that it's not true. I think funding is absolutely essential as well. This project provided us with funding to start conversations. We didn't build a network in Northern Ireland, but we started conversations. We highlighted issues. We highlighted strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats of digital connectivity in a time of COVID, in a time of, I describe it as this digital revolution. But we were also to look at other jurisdictions. We went away, we learned from them, we brought them back, but we brought them into government. And it was the lack of joined up government, I suppose, in Northern Ireland that really, really struck us. So the Department of Finance had responsibility for infrastructure. The Department of Agriculture had responsibility for Project Stratum, which was the full fibre to premises for rural areas. There were other departments then who were looking at connectivity, the health service being one around unblocking the potential of um, delivery of services at a cost effective way to rural communities. But it seemed like everybody was doing their own thing. Then we had Libraries NI doing the Go On NI skills development, which is around supporting exactly what Catherine was saying, helping people to get on digitally. But we had no dedicated digital advocate for Northern Ireland. We had no digital advocate within our councils. And yet everybody was trying to solve the problem, which starts with infrastructure and then builds out from there. So, so I think there's a real push from me, a request from me that government, if government is going to be digital by default into the future, and if we're really serious about unlocking the potential of rural communities, and we're serious about a carbon efficiency in terms of, you know, stopping people having to travel unnecessarily for work when they can work from home, as we've discovered over the last number of, a number of years, then there's something that around the policy drivers for this and, and the willingness. This was an experimental project but this project now needs to grow legs and it now needs to be developed and it needs a legacy. It can't just be, well, that's very good. We tried it and it worked and sure, Orkney's connected. We now need something that says not just the toolkit, but then the enablers that go along with that, which is funding, resources, skills development, and the policy drivers to make that happen. Otherwise, we're just whistling in the wind. Thank you, Kate. Uh, I see you nodding, Shona. I'll come to you for any final thoughts. Yeah, um, yeah, absolutely. It's soapbox time um, in many ways, because whilst I would like to, you know, congratulate and thank um, the consortia for, for bringing this, uh, this project to Orkney and for the learning we've had. Uh, the one thing I would say about projects of this nature is they're time limited. Um, and in theory, we're, we're handing an improvement to a community 
to try it and then we're taking it away from them at the end of that so that that's been a i'm going to use the term failure of some of the government programs um so innovation's great learning's great but we have to reach the point where the softer aspects of these projects uh, result in meaningful change um and for me this is not a technical problem this is a problem of 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 policy um and I'd go as far as to say it, it's it's a it, it's also a problem of those that are trying to sort the problem tend to be located and their understanding and knowledge is is, is based on city dwelling uh, rather than the real on the ground knowledge and experience of uh, of what, what goes on in a rural setting. And we have got this 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 um, horrible balance between income to treasury from um, uh, spectrum licensing. Um, and for how the, the, the market works for telecoms uh, versus the very basic needs of our society. And uh, at, at the end of the day, if uh, we are trying to deliver a sustainable network, then the, the, there should not be policy or, or, or um, restrictions in place that allow a community to develop its own solution. Um, and I think one of my concerns um, at the end of this project is um, we can see the benefits of improved connectivity brings to a society. I've, you know, we've seen that as part of this project, but I still think there are a number of hurdles or um, I'm going to say resistances in place that will actually make it very difficult for communities to, to um, run sustainable networks. So for me, this project has, has, has taken a, a leap forward, but it's still... Um, there, there still are hurdles in place um, that we have to overcome and we have to be more flexible about. And, and I, unfortunately, I'm again going to say that that, that does lie at big government with a big G, uh, big G level. Um, so I would, I would very much um, uh, support my colleagues um, in saying that we have to continue uh, to continue the work uh, to overcome some of the some of the regulatory hurdles. Um, and, ju and just some of the uh, the the costs and drivers that uh, that that uh, that are preventing rural communities getting access to, to to the services that they, in my opinion, should be entitled to, um, rather than have to try and find their own methods to to develop themselves. Uh, and uh, thanks, Shannon. And, and Kat, any uh, any final observations for you? Well, I mean, I. Very much agree with both Shona and Kate. Um, there is a, there is certainly something in, from local authorities we need to, to act um, to safeguard communities because we do see an awful lot of overclaiming in terms of, of coverage by um, 4G. Um, and we, we constantly see that when we look over Ofcom data, because there could be areas where coverage is claimed, but actually the mask has been down for six months and there's no, um, th there's not that, uh, that drive to, uh, to put it right, because the data might only go to, uh, to Ofcom from that company annually. And so, there is, there is a degree that, yes, this is a big government problem that, um, and these are very, very powerful companies that might not see our areas as their key markets because scarce residential population versus, and, and very high challenges for, for infrastructure. Um, but there is to a degree that we, we do need as local authorities, as communities, et cetera, to keep providing the data and saying, well, there's a problem here. Um, let's, let's look at how we could fix it. And be it if, um, if it's not economically viable for um, the larger companies, then are there community routes to fix it? And if the whole toolkit won't help us fix things, will parts of it help us so i think there's 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 a real mix of of what we need to keep doing there's an awful lot of work still to do agreed um i'd like to thank you all for for contributing 
uh, to, to this conversation. Um, uh, I think it's been a, a, a really, really helpful uh, illumination uh, of, uh, of, of the work done and, and, and the approaches that we, we, we that are right out there, and indeed the, the progress that still needs to be made. Um, I think if anyone's interested in, in exploring this more, I would uh, well encourage a, a, a review of the, of the toolkit um, in all its glory. Uh, in particular, actually, just picking up on Catherine's last point and indeed and others uh, about spectrum um, and, uh, and coverage, there is indeed an, an entire uh, conversation uh, about that that's, uh, that, that's available uh, to give communities the, the tools they need to be able to have those conversations from a position of, uh, of, of information. Um, but thank you very much for, for listening and, uh, and, and I get the final word here, Peter. I no, you don't. I get the final word. Yeah, I was going to say my final one. It's a huge thank you to Cisco, um, to Peter, to Des, and to Bobby um, for the for the effort you're putting in on behalf of rural communities. Um, I certainly have appreciated greatly um, the the input uh, from you. So so thank you, and I'm sure my colleagues will share that. Thanks. Fully echoed. Fully echoed by us as well. I mean, we were the outsider in all of this coming in from Northern Ireland, and the not only the welcome and the reception that we got the fact that we didn't have to travel during COVID was hugely important but um I came in and didn't know what a WMO was and didn't know um I can't remember all the different phrases but I remember sitting the very first day and not understanding anything and then getting a follow-up phone call to say don't panic we'll take you through all this stuff and we'll show you and there was hand holding and support and encouragement the whole way from Cisco so a massive thank you to Cisco for for that support, it's it's been enlightening to, to work at, in such a great partnership. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, I, again, I'll echo that. We've been really, um, we, we found an awful lot of interesting things through through sort of being part of this project. And there's been an awful lot that, that we've learned and we've been really, really grateful for, for Cisco for, um, for letting us get involved and, and, and for sort of, for obviously committing to, to being involved in these, this type of work as well. Well, our, our pleasure, uh, and it's um, you know it's been eye-opening for us as well uh, because it's a it's an area we keep learning and we got to keep learning. There's, there's there's more to more to figure out. Um, but no, thank you all. <laughs>